History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 21. Freedom and Bourgeois Society. February 2nd, 1965. I should like to begin by repeating some of the conclusions we have reached last time, following my principle that definitions are not simply to be dismissed out of hand as false, but where they are used, they should follow from philosophical reflection Oops. rather than preceding it with a view to keeping it under control. I told you that will, at least in traditional epistemology, what it is in reality is the problem we are battling with, was analogous to the Kantian object, the ordered unity of all impulses that are found to be both spontaneous and rationally determined. Please accept the definition for the moment, or for the present hour, with the same spontaneity as I have shown in employing it here. It contains, as I hope to show you in detail, problems that have a profound connection with the question of the will, but that is not something I wish to anticipate here. Freedom would be the word to describe the possibility of such impulses, the fact that such impulses are possible. I also explained to you that this solution of relying on clear and distinct ideas is unsatisfactory because it assumes that there is a valid distinction based on form. Either there is a will or there is not. Either the will is free or it is not free. The fact is that we are inclined to adopt such procedures because we have been impregnated with logic, because we have been trained to equate philosophical thinking with logical thinking. Whereas to take up a claim of Nietzsche's, nothing real ever submitted to the laws of logic, since these laws are thought patterns that have been conceived in line with the needs of reason to dominate nature. If philosophy has a task, it is one you may well think highly paradoxical, namely to make use of the methods of reason, among which we must include logic, to define those elements in the object and to reflect on those elements that for their part do not abide by the laws of logic or submit to logic. And if you do accept this for a single second, you must free yourselves. I believe I have not yet stated this so clearly, and so would like to repeat it so that you do not become confused by what I shall go on to say. You must free yourselves from the idea that such questions as either the will is free or else there is no such thing, or either the will is free or it is not free, must be capable of such simple, succinct answers as their form seems to suggest. But the fact is that we simply do not know whether such solutions, such succinct solutions, actually exist. Let us for a moment set aside the fact that the Kantian doctrine of the categories is essentially to do with the theory of reason, that is to say, with the use of reason and the problems that such usage throws up. Setting this aside, I should like to say that the antinomian representation of the problems of freedom and Kant emphasizes the objective aspect of freedom and that it has the extraordinary merit that it too points to the fact that a succinct, unambiguous solution cannot simply be assumed, but that we are faced with the possibility of contradictory solutions. No more than a possibility, one that should probably not be made to depend upon the transcendental use of reason so much as upon the nature of the object. In our perception, and this is something I should like to say by way of criticizing the idea of the will as the kind of internal thing by analogy to external objects, inner perception, self-consciousness, the consciousness that we have of ourselves, whether, whether immediately or through a process of reflection, does not encounter the will in the same way that our external perception encounters objects that occur in various shades, but that remain identical throughout these shadings. But the assumption of such a will is very much an intellectual construct. This means that, even on the assumptions of an idealist epistemological critique, we cannot ascribe to it the kind of substantiality that we are inclined to attribute to the objects of external reality. And if, earlier on, I discussed with you the possibility of pseudo-problems, that possibility refers precisely to the fact that the will is not a datum for us in the sense that objects are givens in the external world. It is not something that retains its identity and is perceived by us in a variety of shades or nuances, 
so that we may feel fully justified in doubting whether we can make such a distinction at all. The reality underlying this alternative, the thing that is meant by it, has something peculiarly peculiarly intangible about it, something that eludes our grasp, that we cannot pin down. And then again, it is something to which we are constantly referred in the same realm of experience in which we speak of human character, of people with a strong or weak ego, or of a person's temperament, which may be sanguine or melancholic or phlegmatic. All these things are qualities that have made an extraordinarily powerful impression on the collective mind without its having been proved possible to discover scientific rules with which to identify objective correlatives for these things. That means, however, that the real problem is that this definition of the will, this concept of the will, is mediated by the very thing from which it has been strictly distinguished by the original question. This remains the case even if you agree that there is such an ordered synthesis of spontaneous and rational impulses as I have postulated in this definition of the will. For the will or the substrata of freedom, or if you prefer, of unfreedom is defined in the first instance by the mon monadological structure of individual human subjects. In other words, by the fact that human beings find themselves confronting the non-mental world, as it, used, as it used to be called, which manifests itself as a coherent and other totality, and they do so by means of their consciousness in the broadest sense, which here includes their emotions and impulses. In disagreement with this, and I believe I have drawn your attention to this several times, this supposedly monadological being is intertwined with the very thing from which it is separated, with both the sphere of experience coming from outside and the impulses that arise within the individual and impinge on the external world. Furthermore, the will itself and the ways in which it separates itself, and this is the dialectical salt that adds spice to these observations, are likewise modeled on the external world and the, real, and the relation to the external world. Consider what I understand by the will and equate it for a moment with a strong, single-minded ego, an ego that does not let itself be distracted by momentary impulses or drift to and fro, but firmly holds its course. We may undoubtedly agree with common usage in claiming that there is an immediately obvious connection between a strong will and a strong ego. If that is the case, we must conclude that this ego authority has itself developed genetically as a means an instrument through which the biological human being, the empirical biological human being, tests himself against reality and learns how to assert himself in the face of the external world, the overpowering external world that assails us human beings and to survive. And if we assume that this identity, this hardness, this opaqueness and impenetrability of this ego authority is modeled on something external, we may reasonably conclude, without wasting too much time on idle speculations, that the hardness that characterizes the will, viewed as a strong ego, has been derived from the hardness and impenetrability of things over which we have no control. As a primitive initial approximation, we might say that this quality of impenetrability is the stratum at which we become conscious of an otherness that is not subject to us, that is something that we are not. We might almost say that the monadolo monadological principle is itself the, pr the product of a quite primitive primary experience of things that stand opposed to our own subjectivity. This means that subject would be object in the very precise sense that the solidity and persistence of the subject is a um, mimesis of the very things that are not intrinsic to the subject. Precisely because they elude us, these things acquire the hardness and solidity that we as firm characters, and perhaps even as the embodiments of willpower, set out to master. You can see from this that, by relating the concept of will to an isolated subjectivity that exists for itself, we end up positing in this separation, this separation of inner and outer, this relation of will to subjectivity, a relation to external reality as well. Not only that, our very model of the human subject turns out to be the non-self. We have the non-self as the model of the self, so that 
if I believe that we may speak of a certain primacy of the object in the foundations, or whatever you would like to call it, of epistemology. Of epistemology. I lost my spot. It is probably this curiously objective dimension of the self that we come across, although I have no wish to conceal from you the fact that all reflections of this kind conceal a cloven hoof. This is that, for such an objectification of the subject to occur, for the sphere of the subject to be assimilated to the sphere of the object in this way, means that something like a sphere of subjective reflection, of subjectivity, must exist. For if there were no such thing as a subject, there could be nothing capable of the self-objectification that I have attempted to show you in the concept of the will. In addition, and this is something I should like to pursue a little, I would draw your attention to the fact that the concept of the will did not make its appearance until relatively late as a philosophical concept in a precise sense, that is to say in the form of the choice between the freedom or non-freedom of the will. Furthermore, when it did appear, it did so in close connection with the realm of intersubjectivity, in other words, with the involvement of human subjects with one another, and hence with the social sphere. In more modern philosophy, the problem of freedom and determinism did not become a topic of discussion until the 17th century, principally in the thought of Spinoza, and then explicitly in the context of the problem of determinism in John Locke. There can be no doubt that the question of freedom, including inner freedom, the freedom of human beings, arose in connection with the emancipation of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, in contrast to the feudal class, postulated freedom in a highly external, objective sense. It meant freedom from the restrictions and dependencies that the feudal system had imposed on the bourgeois order, the bourgeois class. In raising the question of freedom, the youthful, increasingly self-confident bourgeois class felt it essential to ground freedom in the nature of man. From there, it is but a step to inquire whether human beings are essentially free or not free. This rational justification of man proceeds from man's actual liberation, but attempts to ground this actual liberation in his own nature, that is to say, in man's nature as subject. It is an attempt that addresses itself to philosophy at a very early stage, remarkably enough we should note, rather than to the empirical sciences or psychology. We shall have to ask ourselves how this remarkable situation came about. For at first blush, it would seem more sensible to say that the question of whether human beings are free or not is one that should be resolved by the empirical science of man, in other words, psychology. But that is not what happened. And this was not simply because, as you all know, psychology was not so highly developed as the natural sciences during the early bourgeois period, by which I mean the 17th and 18th centuries. The fact is that, as early as Kant, the justification of freedom was not only seen as the province of philosophy, but it was explicitly set up in opposition to psychology. Take a look at the Kantian doctrine of the antinomies, and particularly the third antinomy, where, as I have pointed out ad nauseum, the question of freedom or determinism is of central importance. And think about it for a moment in the context of the contest of faculties, the question of the competence of the different sciences. If you do this, you will see that this third antinomy amounts to something like an antinomy between speculative philosophy on the left side of the page, on the side of freedom, and science as represented by psychology, which stands on the other side of the page. And it is evident that Kant's own sympathies lean heavily towards the side of philosophy. In the critique of practical reason, freedom is no mere theoretical concept, but one that is related to practice. Here, where freedom plays a decisive, positive role, Kant's writing is full of invective against psychology. We can even say that the entire anti-psychological tradition in speculative philosophy goes back to Kant himself. Hegel, too, may be said to have had, had his part in it, and it flared up again some 70 to 80 years ago in Husserl's campaign against so-called psychologism. The tradition experienced its nadir in the abuse hurled at psychology by Karl Jaspers. We may say that this prejudice against psychology is not just a prejudice, but an attitude that is connected with very serious questions. Only in Kant's case, if I may add a few words about that, he begins by defining the sphere of freedom as one radically opposed to that of psychology and reserves freedom entirely for the definition of reason, 
This means that he ends up abandoning psychology to the realm of the empirical and to determinism. Kant would have vigorously objected to the intervention of psychology in what he termed the speculative business of philosophy. But since he thought of psychology as an empirical discipline, he would have granted it a place in the cosmos of the sciences that recent obscurantists seek to deny it. This is connected with the transformation in the attitude of the bourgeoisie towards all enlightenment during the last 150 or 200 years. But I had drawn your attention to the striking and even anomalous question of how it came about that the doctrine of freedom had fallen victim from the very outset, and had even, and it makes me a little sad to have to say it, become the preserve of philosophy. I believe that the answer is that from the very outset, the interests of the bourgeois class were never so unambiguously served by the concept of freedom as reflection on it suggested, and above all, as they appear to be following its decisive ideological manifestations and the struggle against feudalism and then absolutism. For in its efforts to subdue nature, the bourgeois class needs the progressive process of rationalization as an instrument. Disenchantment, as Max Weber called it, making the world scientific, the increasing encroachments of science on the world, a process that, sub that subjects the phenomena of the world incrementally to the laws of science. All that, all that is a mortal threat to freedom. On the other hand, as I attempted to explain to you at the start of this lecture, the bourgeois class has a no less vital interest in maintaining the concept of freedom. This account smacks somewhat of the history of ideas. If we go over to a more realistic description, we might say that from the very outset, bourgeois society was an individualistic society that had established for formal freedom, but had not envisaged one free from coercion of every kind. Thus, bourgeois society always possessed this dual proclivity. On the one hand, it postulated freedom, and in this respect, it tended to look back historically. And on the other hand, it tended to restrict freedom, especially any demands that threatened to go beyond the bourgeois order. These demands, which went hand in hand with a radicalization of the concept of freedom, cut the ground from underneath the bourgeois categories of exchange, free competition, and whatever else formed part of bourgeois ideology. In other words, the bourgeois attitude towards freedom was antinomian through and through. And you may, if you wish, and this too is a possible reading of Kant's third antinomy, deconstruct it socially by arguing that the contradiction that Kant has formulated with such admirable frankness contains the dual interest of the society that is objectively defined by it in this way, without any ideological slant or malign intent. This contradiction became philosophy in the shape of the third antinomy. This means that the thesis represented the interest of the emancipated bourgeois class in freedom, while the antithesis incorporates what has recently been expressed accurately, repeatedly, and in various places all over the world as the fear of freedom. And in general, I do not know whether I have already drawn the relevant passage to your attention. The proof of the antithesis of the third antinomy explicitly formulates the argument that would later become so popular. This is that if we were to release nature from all rules by postulating an absolute beginning, we would escape not just from coercion, but from the guidance of all rules, and indeed there would no longer be any order at all. For profound reasons, for reasons connected with the structure of society, the general bourgeois consciousness has always been vacillating and ambivalent in the sense that it fears the limiting of freedom and the constraints placed upon it while at the same time it takes fright at its own courage and fears that a freedom made real might lead to chaos. This may enable you to understand a phenomenon that lies very much at the heart of the history of the doctrine of freedom, and that will show you just how dialectical the entire com complex of freedom really is. We might well begin by thinking, the ordinary man in the street might well imagine that the interests desirous of freedom, including social freedom, social liberation, that these interests might well hasten to endorse theorems concerned with human freedom. Whereas conversely, we might assume that those who wish to keep human beings in a state of dependency would define human beings as dependent, necessarily unfree creatures, making use of categories drawn from nature. This was in fact common practice in the very early stages of bourgeois philosophy, 
In Hobbes, where the vindication of absolute monarchy went hand in hand with the, with the definition of man as a purely natural creature. This rather primitive explanation may well have appeared plausible, but the fact is that in the history of ideas and the internal logic of such concepts as freedom and unfreedom, history does not always choose the most plausible route that you might expect. I believe that you can well understand why the bourgeois thinkers of the Enlightenment set such curious limits to the idea of freedom. These limits can be seen in the way that freedom was turned into the monopoly of philosophy, and this brings me, so I should like to believe, very much to the heart of the substantive problems of freedom, even though I am speaking in historical terms. For it turns out that the more theory urges the need for freedom, and the more theory insists that human beings are essentially free, that their will is absolutely free, and that they have absolute responsibility for themselves, then the more readily theory lends itself to repression. You can easily explain this to yourselves if you consider the theory of criminal law, which provides us with something of a key to all serious thinking about the subject of freedom. In the theory of criminal law, it is the idealistic Kantian thinkers, the ones who insist upon the freedom of man, free will, autonomy, self-determination, who infer from all this the unconditional responsibility of, of individual human subjects. It is they who, if I may put it in these terms, tend to reject all talk of mitigating circumstances and always seem to be on the point of ensuring that the oh-so-free human subjects are made to feel the full weight of the law at every opportunity, precisely because they are free. You can see from this that ideas that originally had a utopian complexion and a critical complexion tend, notwithstanding their truth content, to, de to, to degenerate in the course of history into ideologies. We can say that the doctrine of freedom really has degenerated gradually into mere de declamations kept for high days and holidays. There is an infallible sign for this ideological distortion of the idea of freedom, one that will enable you to recognize it wherever and whenever talk about freedom lends itself to the justification for restrictions on freedom. In other words, where talk about freedom is perverted into the exact opposite of what it is supposed to achieve. What I have in mind are all the propositions that assert that freedom originally consisted in nothing other than voluntarily accepting a compulsion that human beings cannot escape anyway. Wherever it is maintained that the substance of freedom is that you are free when you freely accept what you have to accept anyway, you can be certain that the concept of freedom is being abused and is being twisted into its opposite. So if we may take up another phrase of Kant's and speak of the interest of reason in this conflict, we may say that this interest is by no means simply man's insistence on his inner freedom as the foundation on which to build his outer freedom. In certain circumstances, man's interest may be the very opposite, namely whatever preserves him from adopting the cause of unfreedom and making it his very own, all in the name of freedom. This is the situation we have again arrived at in our own day. I have only recently read a product of the ideology of the Eastern Zone of Germany, in which it is said almost literally with the same words, of course in the name of dialectical materialism, with the, but with the same end effect, that the freedom that is allegedly to be introduced there consists in people doing of their own free will what they have to do anyway as part of the great movement of history. Of course, this is an old story. I mean, the fact is that the theoretical ideology of the Eastern Bloc closely resembles the, tr the traditional values of the petty bourgeoisie. These values are duly conserved and then put in an appearance from time to time, just as in the realm of art, as you are, well, as you are all well aware. Freedom then, the concept of freedom, has changed its function. The protestation of freedom now enters into the service of repression, of actual unfreedom, this means that extreme vigilance is called for, particularly if you are of the opinion that talk of freedom and unfreedom is not a purely contemplative matter, but real, or to invoke Kant once more in accordance with the idea, that is to say, in accordance with the idea that freedom should exist. This is because an attitude to freedom and unfreedom in the abstract tells us nothing about what a theory or a political system has to say about making freedom a reality. In general, the fact that human beings are inwardly free reinforces the sanctions of the state. 
On the other hand, we can also say that the determinism of the individual sciences has shown itself to be unequal to the problem of freedom. I should say right away that on this point, psychoanalysis has adopted a highly curious ambivalence. Curious because, because it has perhaps gone furthest beyond mere assertion, the abstract assertion of determinism, and has attempted to elaborate it in concrete terms. For on the one hand, it criticized the authority of moral autonomy, the superego, or to put it in ordinary language, the conscience, as in origin, a mental equivalent of unfreedom. And in its heroic phase, psychoanalysis even called for the dissolution of the superego in a noteworthy essay by Ferenczi. But at the same time, psychoanalysis was terribly afraid of what might happen if people no longer had a superego. So psychoanalysis went on to say that we must draw a distinction between a conscious superego and an unconscious one. However, in the light of Freud's analysis of the superego, this is a manifest absurdity, since the superego only has one any power because it is unconscious. An alternative that I once came across in America was to distinguish between a healthy superego and an unhealthy one, which is much like efforts to distinguish between healthy patriotic feeling and a morbid, morbid nationalism. We all know what distinctions of this sort amount to. The consequence of all these things, and this may help you to understand why I'm making such heavy weather of this question of freedom of the will, is that this problem has been betrayed ideologically by philosophy, while the sciences, the individual disciplines, even the most progressive ones, have failed to do it justice. It may also help to explain why this problem, why this entire approach has ended up in a completely wishy-washy worldview. If, for example, you take a look at current debates on criminal law, debates about the foundations of criminal law, you'll find either appeals to a philosophy that is not equal to the task, or else the participants in the debate arrive at their conclusions on the basis of their own worldview, or to use the term that people favor nowadays, according to the commitments or lack of commitments they happen to have at the moment. Thus, what ought to be the most necessary and objective decisions of all, given their extreme seriousness, are made to depend on the most adventitious, adventitious circumstances, namely the ticket that just happens to have been chosen by a man who does not just have a working life, but who also keeps his brain active even when work is over. And this leads me to my conclusion, which I hope will give you something of an idea that philosophy does have a contemporary relevance and is not merely the twaddle to which it threatens to, de to degenerate today. This conclusion is that a serious dialectical analysis of freedom is needed because it is only through a process of philosophical reflection that would include all these elements that the question of freedom can be rescued from the vague waffle that in the long run can have only one consequence. This is that decisions about the legal or constitutional implications of freedom will hide behind these vague ideological commitments and will then be arrived at not through the exercise of autonomous reason, but simply in accordance with the power relations on which so-called worldviews lean for support.